Okay. We have one more chapter after this one, and then everything after that would be review. And one of the things that I want to um, start off today about um, prior to the end of term exam is to give you something about what I was looking for with the case studies. Um, some of you lost marks because you went straight to answering the question. What I was looking for is when you, ana you analyze the facts, what was the principle involved? Uh, for example, if, if the case in front of you had something to do with um, conflict of interest, for example, I would expect that you identify that principle say what are the main tenets of that principle and then answer the question that's been asked. So you would have lost marks on your case study if you just jumped to the answering of the question because the steps is to analyze the facts. Um, there's a, there, one of the facts was in reference to reputational risk. I would expect it uh, two or three liners on what reputational risk is and why that is the principle that is being, that, that you have identified is in this particular thing. And then you answer whatever the question um, asks you. And so be mindful of that when you go into your final, because you will lose mark if you don't identify the principle that is being breached and say a little something about that principle in and of itself, and then go into answering the question as they propose to it, so that it is a clear four step way of analyzing case studies as opposed to jumping right to the answer with the question might may or may not be. You get extra points when you um, then conclude had something else happened, this could have been avoided. Okay, so that just to give you some background on the case studies. The majority of you did very well with the case studies but some persons lost marks because they jumped right into having read the case study, answering the question, I would have done this or I should have done that or whatever have you. And there was no discussion or a few sentences about what the principle in and of itself was. Okay, so that's just a heads up. Um, because I'm, your papers are, are back at this and they, they're lodging their, their notes and their comments and whatever have you. Um, uh, if you haven't done so already, you can speak with Ms. Dean and collect your papers and actually see where you went wrong. Um, on the true false, it was um, persons, I, I'm, I, would re I would say to you to be mindful of wherever there is a always, never, only, it probably is false because nothing is always the case. Um, and there is no, as it, as it relates to the um, definitions, there, that was straightforward. Either you know what it was or you didn't know what it was. Um, but to be mindful of the different styles of ethics, um, utilitarianism as it relates to um, the, the um, deontological, as it relates to the teleological, where there are cultural relativism, those definitions you have to know um, fiduciary responsibility, even, uh, um, um, even if you don't know verbatim the definition of that, um, to understand that it is, it is when something is put in trust, you, um, you are, are, as a person is to safeguard assets for uh, the benefit of someone else, that is sufficient. And if you give an example, then that, that's always also good as well. So as we go to our review, um, I will give you more um, insight. I can't say all of it will be on the exam or whatever have you. I'm, I'm discussing generally where I saw a lot of you lost marks and that was because of not following the methodology of, understand, of, of, of analyzing cases and not reading each sentence very carefully um, when it came to um, the true false bit. Okay, and um, what was expected to be a relatively moderate exam, because it's a midterm and only six chapters, 
was actually covered, you will actually be tested on all 10 chapters um, going into the midterm. So I wanted to remind you of that. And um, so spend time actually understanding and, and knowing how to apply analyzing cases. And I know you know it because you guys would have done it in the case studies that you did where you had to gather up all your facts first and then say what had happened and what happened so on and so forth. And then you looked at the outcome and then some of you actually um, at the very end um, added your own comments as it relates to what were your impressions of the cases that you chose uh, as, and even so much as to why you chose the cases that you chose. And, 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 and the majority of them were very intricate. Um, I, I, now, I now know, even though I had heard about Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, I did not connect it with HSBC until recently. And when I did my further research um, from information that I got from your Dirty Money Netflix program, I saw that um, that bank would have had would have had not only one case but at least three cases within the, in, within the last ten years, and of millions and billions of dollars. And so, what that says to me, and the same thing with UBS um, over the years, that some of these banks have a culture that makes it easy for persons to come in and do some things. And so you, you see some of the same names are coming up, the same big bankers around the world are coming up. And um, um, financial, no matter how much um, governance and auditing or whatever else you put into place, um, people will find a loophole and they will take advantage of it. And um, you're seeing now more and more that some of the big accounting firms are getting pushback and flack for not doing not doing as good a job um, as uh, um, due diligence because there's ways to do what they call forensic accounting and to test the information that has been actually supplied and to pull out samples of X Y Z um, to test whether or not the information is, that is presented has been presented. The other thing that I would say to look out for as you yourself are put in these positions with ethical dilemma is to look at or look at what is the norm. Uh, for example, I remember a few years back, um, interest rates on investment portfolios and insurance products and whatever else was Mm, between five to seven percent, and then an organization came out and say, "Oh, we could guarantee eleven nine to eleven. That says something is amiss, because the natural scheme of market forces would suggest five to seven, and that's across the board. If somebody then, and of course they cannot identify." what they're doing differently from all the other organizations. Um, um, the, those large unexplained changes that's above the norm speaks to and should speak to, let me look a little closer, let me look a little deeper because something is amiss. I, especially in an environment where you're not the only kid on the block. Um, I'm also looking, um, and I would suggest you look at and pay attention to not only the sanctions that are now being levied against Russia, but to look at um, any country index sanctions because um, in some in some rating um, agencies. Um, there are other countries that have been sanctioned and that you're not hearing much about because there is no war as it were going on at the same time. But um, there are lots of financial sanctions. There's lots of political sanctions. Um, there's lots of, I mean, um, relationships and international relationships that speak to why um, people will be setting up sanctions. 
and it's just now coming to the fore. But sanctions have been existing for a while. I mean, from South African nation, um, North Korea, South Korea, any kind, of, any one of them would have had some sanction or another. Cuba has been under sanction and embargo by the U.S. for the longest while. So pay attention to what's happening around the world in, by way of sanctions and what our role might be in. Um, I'm still keenly interested in, in um, declarations from our central bank on what's been happening in this country unbeknownst to us. The common man on the street and the numbers and the, and the volumes of monies that have been um, circulating in a few hands in, the, in this country in which we live and which we love. So um, just pay attention, keep, keep, keep notes of what's happening in the media, find out and see um, what's happening on in, um, these social platforms as it relates to your country and what's happening in the country. And um, it's interesting that the jewel in the crown, as it were, of the Caribbean, um, is so aligned with so many of the other financial organizations that um, it'd be hard to detangle all of this going on in our country. The other thing that is also being seen, um, and I don't know if you've seen any of it recently, but um, when they talk about um, the average salary in the Bahamas. And um, when I last heard, it was around twenty-three to $25,000. Um, I, I am convinced that there, something is amiss um, because I've seen younger and younger individuals start off with way higher incomes than 25000 So, Either we're looking at the majority of the hotel workers in the um, housekeeping, busboying, and whatever else, we have more of them involved with a few. I mean, pulling down the average, but um, I always, I'm always, um, what's the word, surprised that the national the national salary is as low as it is. As it is. That's, that's my personal take. But um, those things, as a person in the financial arena, persons understanding how money works and how money, money is supposed to be the medium of exchange, understanding what are you exchanging your money for and how are you um, arriving at the, your, your personal cost of living and dealing with your personal cost of living and making decisions that would not put you in a position that might cause you to do something um, not only unethical, but illegal. You know, you have to be very, very, very careful. And not paying attention to what the Joneses are doing is, 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 a, is a good thing because you yourself know what you need to do in order to be successful at uh, whatever it is that you're doing. So any comments on anything that we would have studied in the past, anything that jumps out of you, jumps out at you from the sections that we would have done and that you might want to bring to, to the table now with your colleagues or other than politics, other than religion, things happening in the financial services industry that we need to know about. I have a question for Kendrick, um, I, I'm not sure. Um, are, are the credit unions now being regulated by Central Bank? June 1st, 2015. From then, okay. From then, they were all cooperatives for then licensees under the uh, uh, mm -hmm. Central Bank mm -hmm. in regards to reserves okay. and all, all other aspects. And corporate governance? And corporate governance because 
we um okay when from what i remember the fatf recommendations the banks were not the only ones who were deficient but i think the cooperative movement as well because mm -hmm. i think that they cited uh which one is risk but the risk assessment was never in place for the whole country that was okay. that's, uh recommendation one that was never in place like that for the country but in regards okay. to npos i think they mm -hmm. fell under the commission uh, securities commissions i think they fell under them them and the insurance commission correct correct um yeah they did. Certain, certain aspects that cooperatives did not have to i'm trying to remember they did not have to report Exactly. I think it was the credit unions and some MPOs. That had to be changed. The only, th yeah, because churches could be, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling right now. Yeah, MPOs and the cooperatives, I think there were aspects that they needed to report on as well. But in regards to, regu to under the regulator set, cooperative movement is, on, is under the central bank. Okay. Um, the and other they, thing they, they close MPOs too. Yeah. They close. Um, yeah, a few of them were closed because our church was closed. Okay. They were required to close, merge into a a bigger um, credit union, and okay. that's that's what they had to do. They closed all accounts, but like the insurance purposes for the they have a set was it um, burial society yes. insurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. what they they transferred those um, accounts into another um, credit union so that the the members wouldn't lose what they had already put into it. Okay. Miss uh, Frazier. Yes. You hit pause on the reporting. Okay. Chapter four, putting corporate governance into practice. The objectives of this chapter is to always be in a position and is key to understand the role of the board of directors and compare the roles of executive directors to non-executive directors. And you also be, should be able to explain the factors that will influence how the board is composed. Um, we always want to be mindful that the roles and responsibilities of the chairman and the chief executive officer is very defined. And in the majority of cases, I won't say in all, because sometimes it just don't happen every way, but in the majority of cases, it is a sign of good corporate governance when the chairman of the board is not the CEO. Because then you, you need to have that audit check and check and balances in place. Um, so we're going to have to really look at the responsibilities of the chairman and the CEO. We're going to also look at how the performance of directors can be assessed. And also too, I find directors are more, more apt to participate if they, are being, if they are on a paid board as opposed to just being on a board. And some persons who start organizations they say, oh, he's my friend, so I want to have him on my board. Because he, he, he seems to know what's happening or whatever of you. Um, but what they are now suggesting, in, in, and, and it depends on the size of the organization as well, is that there should be somebody with a legal background on the board. And there should be somebody with an accounting background on the board. And so the board is not having to go outside all the time to to understand financial statements for for example or to understand a lot of the, the regulatory reporting that has happened in the last two years or so and 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 what is the challenge in and of itself is being able to navigate these government portals that have just sprung up over the last two years because some of the people inside the government agencies cannot give you the direction that you need in order to properly re, um, report the things that you have to report. And just when you was getting um, past Cicero, for example, you had all these beneficial owners and then you had all these other stuff. And 
and um, all the FATCA um, and so on. And you know, um, the, the country to country, um, country to country reporting, all with a view to track money internationally and to understand the implication of any um, uh, or terrorist activity, finance, terrorist financing, or anti money laundering, and um, I, I I take particular interest with um, some of the gaming houses and what they're planning on doing or have been doing between um, New Providence and the other family islands with banks pulling out of, the, out of those islands and, and what is happening. Will they get to the place where, I mean, I, I could not imagine any entity would have too much money that they don't know what to do with it. To me, in, in, in my simple mind, that, that is just not possible. But um, I'm hearing consistently that people are looking for ways to spend some of the money that they do have. And so it's with keen interest that I look at um, what is happening in some of the areas and what would be the impact of, um, I don't want to say, I mean, it, what is the impact of how we are as a country view internationally um, by some of the things that we allow to happen in this country? And would that mean more regulations coming down the pipeline and whatever have you? I, 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 would, I was um, surprised to have gotten a letter in the mail from a financial institution. Um, I, was of the, I, I was always told that the account was, um, the account was closed and then they sent me a letter to say, um, the balance on the account is X and they took out some fees and so I'm having to, I have, I having to go into find out why, I mean, in my simple mind, having just under $500 don't mean the account is closed, but I've never been able to withdraw any money from that account. So I think I know who that is, but listen. <laughs> now send me a letter to say, your balance is now $425. They know what that means, right? I go in and there to get my $425. That's a lot of money to me. So why you couldn't withdraw from it? I understand now that the minimum, the minimum balance on the account should be $500. Oh, so you're not charging any charges, monthly fees? I am being charged monthly fees. You shouldn't if your balance remain at five hundred dollars at the end of the month. So what they what they sent me was your five hundred dollars, what was there two or three years ago, is now to four hundred and twenty-five dollars. That's because they take out twenty-five dollars a year for inactive fee. Well, they can't. But I mean, if, if they would let me take the money off their account, it, it wouldn't be inactive. It wouldn't be inactive. <laughs> Exactly, and they should have said something to you from the break. <laughs> Anyhow, it only says to me that sometimes people get caught up in so much of the regulatory red tape that they forget customer service. At the end of the day, I suppose to still be trying to exceed customer expectation and helping my customer to understand how to navigate through some of the regulations that are coming down the pipeline. So that's the only reason why I mentioned that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not upset about it in any, any which way. Um, we're also going to look at how the remuneration committee and the remuneration and nomination committee actually go about choosing and finding directors. Um, as far as um, government agencies are concerned, the board of directors have to be approved by cabinet. Um, 
We're going to look at best practices in relationship to disclosure and communication with shareholders. And we're also going to look at, again, how this com the combined code of practices bears on corporate governance. And so, generally speaking, we have to put in place a system that will en enable those managing the business to be able to review the strategic plans of that business and to make certain that everything is in order according to what um, you want to have happen. And also to, to make sure that, did I lose somebody? I think I lost Tamiko. Um, she dropped off. Also to, to be able to look at the nomination committee and how important it is, their role is, and to examine the function of the standing committee and um, to see how they set the director's remuneration packages and the responsibility in order to get remunerated um, and, um, and implementing those packages to the best interest of the company with the personal aspiration of members of the executive team. So it shouldn't be, I'm just sitting on the board to collect money, I should be actually helping to direct the business of the board and with my influence being able to steer the organization in the direction that, that the company wants to go in. So we have to always look at the duties of the organization to communicate with their shareholders. And this involves um, complying with the organization um, and the, the, the proper disclosures to be in place and um, involves um, mandatory um, requirements are settled by the companies out, for example, are settled by um, the financial institution if you're collecting money and those other things like that. So we're gonna look at what is appropriate to make these um, disclosures. So on the bottom of 116, it actually speaks to the role of the board of directors and um, the report concludes um, when they talk about the combined codes that deals with directors in general, but um, the combined code, code came out of the Higgs report, which considered the role in, in more detail of directors. And it says that the board should be responsible for promoting the success of the company and providing entrepreneurial leadership at the apex of the organization. So it's the board's responsibility to direct and supervise the affairs of the company, implement and maintain a framework of prudent and effective controls that will enable risk to be assessed and managed. So the risk has to be assessed in advance and identified and, and discussions and documentation have to be shown as to how these risks could be managed. And the board should set strategic aims within the context of the values and standards that's expected by the shareholders, ensuring that obligations to shareholders will be met. And the board um, ensures that the necessary resources are in place and managed performance is reviewed on an ongoing basis. So generally boards exist for anywhere from three to five years, usually a term. Um, some boards, um, I, I haven't seen many that only last one year because if you're setting the strategic direction of the organization at a strategic level, it takes about three to five years for that organization to get to where it needs to go. And so um, if you're changing the board every year, you cannot be in a position where you could set the stage and see that the monitoring takes place. And so um, they have to be looking at it for a longer period if you're talking strategic direction. But they must have built in monitoring and reviews of performances and also too, I, I, um, I've heard of boards where um, there were meetings held, but when the new regime came on board, all of the documentation as it relates to that board was not to be found. So it seems like every turnover, that new board is starting from scratch. Um, what I've seen to deal with that is a lot of persons are doing electronic recording and actually having using um, digitized programs 
that someone coming in new could go back and archive and see some of the decisions that was made and why those decisions might have been made. So um, we have to look at these plans on an annual basis. There must be an, an AGM and at the AGM, all shareholders um, should be invited to understand what has happened over the last year. Um, um, annual plans must be consistent with the achievement of the longer term objectives. So um, as it relates to the structure of the board, executive directors, as it comes again, mentions again, executive directors are full-time employees of the organization and their operational duties are dictated by a contract of employment. So executive directors actually work with the organization and they do have a contract of employment with the organization. Non-executive directors do not have a contract of service and are not employees. But however, all directors are accountable and dictated to by the Companies Act. And it requires them to exercise their power, their powers with reasonable care and skill. And they require them to observance of their fiduciary responsibility, their responsibility to shareholders, as well as to the organization in which they operate. And um, there should be a balance of each type of directors. Um, and non-executive directors should com comprise at least one third of the board because you want that objectivity to be in place. And in, in practice, most companies um, and nearly all financial service providers have a majority of non-executive directors. The, the, the usual members who are on the, the, the usual executive directors are usually the CEO and the financial controller, the CFO. They will sit on the board usually automatically because the financial direction of the organization is always a, a very important role that they want to have in place. And um, you have to be very, very sure um, where there's no legal requirement to have a financial director, but most companies do have an executive on the board who's a qualified accountant because you want to be able to have somebody who, when the financial controller explains what is happening, somebody else is there to make sure that the proper understanding is being in place. And usually in, in those scandals that we saw it is where the CFO and the CEO are actually conspire together to defraud the organization or to cook the books as it were, or to make proper different representation where people are not sure as to, to what the what is happening. So you want to be in a, you want to be in a position where you have somebody who understands and could actually um, decipher the information that is being presented on behalf of the board. Um, so it is it is going to be more common in practice that you have a financial person on the board. The chairman of the board is nearly always a non-executive director because um, you want him to be in, in, in a position to objectively ask questions of the CEO, okay? Um, the board, um, should meetings of directors should meet at least on a monthly basis. Um, but if more is happening, more is going on, the company, the, the company's more active, the board might be doing round robins more than a monthly basis. And most large companies have a boardroom um, at the operational headquarters, so they can call people very quickly. And a lot of meetings have been now being held by Zoom. So meetings do not have to be in one location or even face-to-face. -face. Um, there's lots of video conferencing and teleconferencing going on now. And non-executive directors sometimes meet independently of the executive directors on a regular basis. So they could objectively look at 
what the executive directors are doing and then make a call as to what can and cannot be done. Um, the meetings usually deal with routine and non-routine business. And the routine business might consist of confirming the minutes of the previous meeting as true and accurate, signing up the minutes by the chairman, dealing with any matters that might come arising out of the minutes or standing from previous minutes. And it's always good to have a action list coming out of each meeting, um, something to say what is to be done by whom and by when. And um, anything that came out of any other business from the previous meeting should now um, appear on the agenda of the current meeting. I actually had um, the director of cooperative say to me, as secretary of one of the, the cooperatives that I'm involved in, to say, um, it's not a good idea to put any other business on your agenda because when you, once you do that, you're opening yourself to having another meeting after the meeting. And then you end up spending more time discussing any other business than a lot of the things that's on the agenda. So if it's that important a uh, 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 thing that you want to discuss, that person should call in and make sure that it appears on the agenda and is given the appropriate um, uh, the appropriate attention because people take that any other business to discuss any and everything that they want that was on their chest and whatever else, which, which actually extends the meeting. And I thought that was very interesting because all of the agendas that I've seen is this AOB, any other business. If it's, if it's that important, get it on the agenda, is what her comment Ms. was. Ms. Frazier, question. Mm -hmm. I think I did read where they, you should give the shareholders the ability to, or individuals, the leeway to put AOB on the uh, formal agenda because it may be something that needs to be addressed. So, uh, her, her thing was, if it was something that needs to be addressed, you didn't, you didn't just think about it in the meeting. So oh. you, were, you were thinking about it before. So all you needed to do as a director, you call up the secretary and have it put on the agenda. Because what happens is, if it's that important, people need to think about their answers in advance than having to answer it in the meeting. So it's, it's a way of getting people more prepared to have a good dialogue than us to put people on the spot. And, 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 and I don't know if it is um, a requirement by the company's act as it were, but it's, it, it is something that should be looked at to, 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 to be um, um, to assist the board meetings to run more efficiently is what her comments were. I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I'm just saying there's different train of thoughts as to putting any other business on the agenda. So that's open. And um, there should be reports from the chairman. There should be reports from the CEO. There should be reports from any standing committees and reports of key management functions, such as finance or operations. These kinds of things should be on the agenda as the routine um, course of business of, of the board and, and, the, and the meeting of the board. And discussions of matters of specific strategic importance and uh, there, uh, here in, in, in this, on page 120, is speaking of consideration of one-off issues that need to be dealt with at board level. So that is your any other business. And that's what they're suggesting is a part of the routine business. And then they also mention strategic function that each board meeting should be properly structured with a formal agenda 
fundamental decisions affecting the future of the business should be considered by the whole board as a collective executive entity and not confined to discussion by just the executive directors. And anything to do with any new acquisitions or new mergers, any um, disposal of fixed assets, major investments, those kinds of things should be a part of, of, of the board, the board discussion. And then the board should monitor the performance of their chief executive officer and put in place systems for monitoring the performance of the board as a decision-making body and the performance of individual directors. So um, I've seen also two where board, board meetings uh, or, or a lot of the governance of some boards have where if a director misses a certain amount of meetings, that they could be um, terminated from the board. Um, if they miss a certain amount of meetings without explanation, they could be terminated from the board. Um, the, I, I won't go over again on page 122, which talks about the executive directors and non-executive directors again. Um, except that the, the non-executive directors can come from a, a, a wide range of professional, professional occupation. And um, the report actually urges companies to take a broad view as possible of candidates because the more people can participate at the, the level of the organization, the better, the more diversified. Um, you, 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 don't, you don't want to have a board where everybody on the board are lawyers or everybody on the board are accountants because they, they, they're trained to think in a particular way and, and you want to be able to get as wide as possible distribution of professionalism that will give you um, different perspective on, on different things. And so the roles of the non-executive directors is on page 123 which talks about the strategy. They have to formulate strategy. They have to do um, um, critically oversee the role that they should have on an objective view and free from any biases. And they should have um, imprudent decisions and even improper behavior. They should actually be able to consider all these things. Did somebody behave inappropriately? Um, they should look at the people and how they are being managed in that board. And non-executive non directors can add value by acting as a catalyst for discussion and decision-making and resolving any conflicts that might um, arise between management and executives or executives and the directors. You know, because they are independent and sometimes, most of the time, removed from the day-to-day -day management of the organization, you expect them to be more objective. And depending on the business, you might need specialized knowledge and experience that would be harnessed um, during the, the, the course of the board's work. For example, if you were talking about an energy board, it'd be nice to have environmentalists or um, what's the other, oh, um, uh, engineers, that kind of thing on, on, on the board. And so what's important for you to know is on page 124 when they talk about the advantages and the disadvantages of non-executive directors. And the advantages would include external experience and knowledge and skill. Um, they are less likely to be insulated or affected by the culture of the organization. They provide, they provide assurances to or reinsurance to stakeholders that decision will not be confined to a small group of directors and the individual directors may act as confident either to their board colleagues or to further management chain. You could reach out to the board. Um, the person who is the internal auditor, for example, would, audit, would normally speak directly to the board and not the CEO. And they can act as a catalyst to move discussions forward. And they could be used sometimes too, depending on their expertise and training and um, involvement in the community to lobby on behalf of the board as well, because they might have some influences on, on the government or the politicians of the day. So those are some of the advantages of a non-executive director. 
The disadvantages is that they may not always be independent. Our subdirectors have con um, um, connected businesses and commercial relationships that could cause a conflict of interest. Uh, and the lack of independence may arise if directors form friendships or align their views to specific executive directors. And sometimes because they're too lazy to look at the tasks themselves, they might just go along with whatever is said, you know, and not really participate at the level where they make um, valuable contribution. And so there may be a lack of good quality directors who are willing to serve. And especially if it's a non-paying board, you're going to find that um, sometimes you can't find um, sufficient people to participate at that particular level. Um, and so you don't get the quality of board member of directors as you would want. So you have to be very careful. And then in some environments, they may lack influence and therefore have limited power powers to intervene on behalf of the board. So that is, the, I would say, something that you really need to look at, which is, and it, and it continues on page 125, um, keeping in mind that the mere fact that we put them as directors of the board, we want to be sure that they have the legal, moral, and ethical issues free from internal politics and any vested interest um, will not be seen. And they have the expertise to make a contribution to the board. Um, that has always been a challenge with some of the boards that we see where um, you can't even understand. I, I had a friend who was put on the, the, um, uh, the film and uh, something to do with the culture and film and, and, and the film board where they look at um, pictures coming into the country and whether or not they are appropriate to get the appropriate ratings in the Bahamas as opposed to anything else. And she said she was completely out of her element because she don't like watch TV to begin with. She never goes to the movies or whatever. I mean, she couldn't even understand why she was on that board. And so you have to be very careful. And public, public companies and the boards of public companies um, sometimes have a different way of being put together than private companies. And um, sometimes it's good for the directors of private companies to, they, they might also be shareholders, but they don't have to be. They don't have to be shareholders. And when you start to, put people there who have a vested interest in the, how the organization should work. It sometimes could influence negatively the decisions that are being made because the people are making decisions based on a return on their investment as opposed to um, anything else. So you have to be very careful um, that a lack of independence should not prevent a person from serving as a director but any connected interest should be disclosed to the board. And that's one way of getting around the conflict of interest. It should be disclosed to the board and also to the shareholders. And where matters relevant to any connected issue are discussed, that person concerned should be excluded from the discussion and even excluded from the meeting and not be able to vote on the issues to be decided. So it's saying that just because Kendrick worked for teachers and salary workers, and we're deciding whether we should move our money to teachers and salary workers, and he might be on our board of our company. That doesn't preclude him from being a member of the board. It just says that anything to do to discuss with the teachers and salary workers union, credit union, Kendrick will exclude himself from voting on it, and he will exclude himself from the discussion of the decision to move to that, to that environment. But at all times, you would expect that your directors will have a high standard and demonstrate integrity and sobriety. They should support leadership. They monitor the conduct of their leaders. They should question, debate, and challenge, but also listen. They can earn trust and respect from their performance on the board. 
and then they should be consequence consciously promote high standards of corporate governance. So I'm going to now do something that we haven't done for a while. I have, yeah, I have enough. Um, I'm going to put you in a breakout room to, to discuss two cases. And then we can talk about it some more. Um, the first case is on page 126, the Standard Chartered Bank case. And the next case is actually on the, the um, let's see. page 118, Alternative Board Structures. And so, um, group one is going to be the Alternative Board Structure on page 118, and group two is going to be the, the case on page 126, I think it was, yeah, on page 126. Okay, so allow me to put you into the, in, in the breakout room the, that I need you to look into. Um, on page 127, the role of key officers. So, we, so at first we were talking about directors and they in turn set the tone and strategic plans for the organization. And now they have the officers. Um, the, the officer, the main thing with officers, a distinction can be made between the role of the chairman and the role of the chief executive officer. They've repeated that statement at least three times in the same chapter. And that's because that is something that's crucial to corporate governance, okay? And if you got that question wrong in my exam, I would definitely, I'm not saying it's gonna be on the paper, mind you, but if that question was on the report on the exam and you were still saying the CEO and the chairman could be one and the same, I'd be very hurt because in this one particular um, chapter, they repeated that same statement, leaving it out by itself in there at least three times already. The chairman is the focal position on the board of directors. And in most organizations, the chairman is a non-executive director and has no day-to-day -day involvement in the running of the business. However, the chairman should remain in touch with the chief executive on a regular basis and the chairman has a very public role in the sense that he or she will deliver the report of directors to the shareholders and will quite often be a spokesperson when communication with the media. So he has to be a man, a person of, of um, high integrity, of character, and also in, in most cases, that person should be very charismatic because he's making um, conversation and decisions um, with the public. And, and so the public persona is, is what's called in the question. Okay. Now, the chief executive office is the head of the operation and leads the management team. This requires daily involvement in the organization, whereas the chairman will uh, um, the chairman will, will share the board meetings and may be a member of one or more standing committees. The chief executive officer will have an executive or management committee that will meet on a weekly basis because he is running the day-to-day -day management of the organization. Okay, and then just below that, it, 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 what's in critical of importance is the role of the chairman and the, and the, the chief executive officer. So you need to have that clear, undefined, and differentiated. Do I need to get any more than that? And then, oh, uh, sorry? You could, no, ma'am, we good. All right, go ahead. Okay, so just so I'm clear, the role of the chairman and chief executive, executive we need to know both of those, right? Mm-hmm. responsibilities. Yes. 
the, the whole box, right? Just just asking for a friend. That whole box. <laughs> but, 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 no, but watch this. That whole box, the, the, the sentences in, in there, for example, the figure that the company represented before, the shareholders and the media, I didn't expect you to know every word and every line. I expect for you to know that he's a representative for the shareholders in the media, the chairman. I expect you to know that he runs the board meetings. You see what I'm saying? So you don't, have, you don't have to regurgitate sentence for sentence, but you have to know that when it comes to the board meeting, the chairman controls the meeting. Okay, duly noted, Mom. Okay, and then he could, he could liaise with the chief executive and decide on the agenda and whatever have you. But at the end of the day, he is in control, the chairman of the meeting. And so you have to know the difference between their roles as it is laid out in that box. Yes, sir. And the segregation of those roles is essential. And why it's essential is what's on page 128, which is under, which is the second box just above the quick the quick um, um, right. quick question. It has the segregation of these roles is essential because there's too much for one person to do. The roles are quite distinct and there are inherent conflicts between, between them. The chief executive is accountable to the board, but the chairman leads the board. So there can be no accountability if the same person does both job. Okay. And, and so you need the chairman to check that the CEO is doing what he's supposed to do and to avoid creating any dynasty. Most organizations, um, they try to avoid this by the, um, the authority is, is, is not concentrated in one particular area. And so like if you, if you have a, a chairman who's the father and the CEO who's the son, I mean, come on, you know there are gonna be some major conflicts and some major issues as it relates to that. So those five bullet points there, definitely you need to know. And then um, the board committees, the, 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 the different committees, the, 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 the four main committees are set out here, the audit committee, the nomination committee, the remuneration committee, and the risk committee. What these committees are responsible for? Okay. The role of the risk committee is fulfilled by the audit committee and virtually all finance institutions have a risk committee because all of the things that could impact the organization is what comes under that particular area. And um, the risk committee may have uh, proportionate uh, more executive directors. None of that is, is, is chisel in stone, but when you look at what their roles are, you're able to see uh, why it made good sense to have non-executive directors or executive directors on, on, on these committees. Because mind you now, these committees are committees within the board. They're not subsequent committees outside or external of XYZ. These are committees within the board, the board committees itself. Okay. The nomination committees, the, the most companies have articles and association that provide for the retirement of directors by rotation. In other words, the directors only serve at a certain later time, and how do you go about vetting the new people who want to be directors on the board and, 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 and making sure that they retire at a, at, a, at a regular time? And if they are eligible, suppose they, somebody suggests somebody to be on the board who is a person of ill repute. The nomination committee is the one who's gonna deal with disqualifying or, or not um, qualifying any, suggested person who are nominated on the board. So by the time it comes to the AGM and the election time, they would have already vetted all the persons that would have been nominated. And some people, some people say in their boards that they accept people from the floor while others say, no, we're not because we want to have, we want to be in a position where we would have already done our due diligence on that individual has been nominated. So you need to know the responsibility of the board committees. Okay, 
And that's what the rest of this chapter is actually about. It goes into the terms of office of the directors. It goes into the nomination committee on page 130. Uh, and, and it's not my intention to go through every, every page of this chapter, but I think that the critical concern is that it's a lot of reading. But once you isolate the main characters and understand um, all the organizations are looking at and wanting to look at uh, what are those critical things that would be that mean success for the organization. And um, all the directors, all of the board members are looking at this, the same thing. So don't worry about whether it came up from the hates report or the next report, but just that you're familiar with the way boards are operating because the combined rules is what I'm looking at. And all of that has now gotten to the place where the rules are combined. Okay. Sorry about that. Any questions? Um, when you get to the latter pages of this chapter, which speaks to um, performance of, um, of individual directors, which is on page 134, and the removal of the directors, um, it is the way in which it's done. So I don't expect I, I don't I don't expect that um, uh, it, uh, if you look at the removal, for example, the members can be removed um, can remove a director from office, and this can be done by ordinary resolution, which requires just a, a majority vote, or the board may do so by expressing no confidence in one or more of the directors, or through mental incapacity, or through I I might not ask that. Um, the question might not be asked that you list the removal of the board. The question might be a true false question, which say you could remove the board really needed when you think. You should know whether you need to remove them by mental incapacity or through insolvency or through any disqualification and the company's directors act. So they will cease to be a director if they resign. They just might decide to resign. You know, you have to know that there is a process for removal of directors. There's a process on, on a way of how remuneration for directors, because this book is taking the, the position that all directors are remunerated for being on the board and why directors being paid might be a good idea. And, and, and on page 135, they talk about it might be remuneration is necessary in order to attract directors of sufficient quality, provide incentives for performance, and retain directors to ensure continuity in, direct, in direction. So if you really step back and, 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 and look at, okay, I'm forming a company. How would I get and how can I get people to participate, why it make good sense to pay them. You, the team that I'm talking to now is sufficiently exposed that they can guess at the answers why it might be a good, why it might be a good thing. Because you need people on your board who is committed to the progress of the board. And when you start paying them for their services, their commitment is increased. And you can attract good quality individuals because they are accustomed to being paid for being on the board. When you have people who are just placed on board, some may not show up because someone else come up and they're more busy. Um, some may um, not show up and continue to not show up because there's no disciplinary and action in place of, of how they could be removed. And if they're not getting paid, um, then you removing them is no skin of their back because, hey, they're not getting paid. They can find something else to do at that particular time. 
So it actually tells you um, remuneration of board members is a advantage and the remuneration committee whose responsibility, um, who, who is responsible, who is charged with setting what the remuneration would be, the pay structure, the levels of pay, the performance related components of that pay and um, how we could um, incentivize them to continue. So all of that is, I hate to say in some cases it's common sense because common sense is, is not common practice, but um, if you thought about it, just like you, if you were to be asked to be on the board, you would want to be, you can be considering how much time is involved, do I have the expertise to, to make a valuable contribution? Am I going to be getting paid for my, my, my contribution? And, and, and the likes of that. So if I look at the company, you're looking at three structure of the company, the board, you're looking at the officers of the organization, the CEO, the, 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 the CEO, the CFO, the secretary, um, those people, and then you're looking at the shareholders. The shareholders are owners of the organization. They actually have skin in the game as owners. Not all shareholders sit on the board and not all board members are shareholders. The roles are very separate and distinct between those two entities. The shareholders are the ones who are owners and they put up the capital to start the organization. And as a result of that, them being owners and they actually put up the capital for the risk, they have significant rights uh, um, as it relates to the company. And those rights you will see on page 139. The registration of the ownership of shares, the right to transfer, gift or bequeath their shares, the right to information, including notice of meetings and site of the full account. So as shareholders, this information cannot be withheld from you. You cannot say, oh, we had a meeting, but we didn't invite you. Um, they have this right to information, including all the notices of any meetings and the site of all the full accounts and participation in general meetings and with others to call general meetings. So they need to know what's going on with their money. But they are not necessarily, they are not the ones whose job function it is to deal with the day-to-day -day management of the organization. The officers of the organization, the CEO, the, C, the, the CFO, the managers are the ones who involve the day-to-day -day operation. The board of directors, have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders and the managers. They're supposed to make sure that things go according to plan and the shareholders sit back and supposedly will get a proper return on their investment. So they don't have to be on the board, but they should be at all the meetings and they should be able to ask any questions as it relates to information on, the meet, on, on how the company's being run and they could actually leave their shares to somebody else or give their shares to somebody else. And so organizations now and the beneficial owners are, it's critical who owns these companies. And a lot of people used to hide behind the fact that they own companies. And you would have somebody who would have a company, for example, set up another company to service the first company and don't, don't want nobody to know that they're involved in. So, so the, the Beneficial Owners Act now makes it, makes it um, illegal for you not to clearly disclose who are all the owners of all the companies involved and any third party interest that they might have in other organizations that service the original organization or, or, or the main organization. They want, they, they, they want the ownership to be transparent and everybody to be in place as to what should and should not be happening. So once you get clear in your mind that there are 
board of directors whose role is to set the, the, the strategic goals of the organization. They were put in place uh, by a nomination committee and sometimes with the influence of the shareholders because the shareholders are the ones who put up the money to form the company in the first place. They are the owners of the company and, and, and the board of directors have a responsibility that goes up to the, um, to the shareholders as well as down to the management team and the executive. And they, their responsibility uh, um, is that they would, for the shareholders, they'll give them a good return on their investment and they make sure that all the, the um, things are in place. They make sure that all, everything is in place to run the organization appropriately. Okay. And then, and then um, the, the uh, chairman, I'm not the chairman. The chairman is chairman of the board. The CEO is the face of the organization in terms of management of the organization. And we sometimes have where the CEO is trusted in the, in the media in the media because they see it out as the person who is running the day-to-day -day operation. But usually the, the chairman of the organization is who should speak on behalf of the organization and actually be the voice that people um, listen to. And you don't want, want to have all the different board members run into the mediator, I mean, run into the media and giving their specific um, position on the organization because they are not the ones who should be speaking on behalf of the organization. So once you know there's these three different groups and what are their responsibilities and their responsibilities to whom you would have actually gotten all their need to be gotten from, from um, that chapter um, on corporate governance. And the other bits of what, uh, what, it, what, what it comes up to is um, the running of an annual general meeting. What are, the, what are the notices time? What should be included in the business presentation? Um, um, what, are, what are the substantial issues to be discussed in, in that environment? and how they can move certain resolutions in, in their meeting and the adoption of any, any meetings. So all of that is how in these board meetings that should be have at least one general meeting, annual general meeting once a year, but the monthly board meeting is to make sure that you keep kicking the can down the road to carrying out all, all the, um, the issues that come up in the, in the organization and to resolve um, any, um, anything that prevents performance of the organization. And, and what, I, what, what is, what is um, might be discouraging in how the structure of this chapter is, is because they having set out the three different constituencies and it might be best to probably write that separately on a piece of, on, on, on some notes and actually put the advantages and disadvantages on their roles and just study that is that they keep coming back. They keep mixing up the paragraph because, for instance, on page 141, they come back with principle based disclosure, which takes into account the principle based, um, uh, principle -based approach to organizations and compliance with these principles are set down, but it has set down as it, run, as it depends on the running of an organization. So everything we're talking about in this particular chapter is how do we govern the business and, and how business is governed and what are some of the things that are put in place to make sure there's transparency, there is um, um, performance indicators, as to people knowing and understanding how the company is performing before you get into a place where you're going downstream and you're losing money. And, and, and the reports that you're getting, um, you should be in a position where you can challenge and, and, and check out the due diligence in those reports. So any questions so far? Um, does that help you to kind of look at how to weigh through 
some of the fluff in this particular chapter? Yes, ma'am. A okay. lot. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. And then on the top of page 141, for example, it says the annual report that should be shared before the annual general meeting. The annual report is this, this, this booklet, this form, or um, this document that is the main form of communication with shareholders. And it should convey a balanced and a fair view of the organization. And the report should take um, the, 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 the report should state whether the company is compliant with the requirements of codes and should make disclosures of the board of directors, any members, their profiles, executive or non-executive, membership of, of, of committee remuneration. So if you if you say this annual report should disclose on the board of directors, everything related to the board of directors would follow. So you don't have to remember it is the members, the profile, executive or non-executive. It is everything as it relates to the board of directors. And then any internal controls that are, that are, that are in place. And one of the high things, the high points of companies now is always the financials, okay? Um, as a part of the annual report. And then to, um, there should be, and, and, and with the, on the annual report or in the annual report is usually an auditor's report on, an auditor starts saying that they have reviewed the financial and they are signing off on them. So they have audited the information that they've gotten and everything seems to be in order with a proper accounting standards. That should be a part of the annual report as well. So that people know that um, the company is, buyer, is, is viable. If the company is losing money, or there's expecting to be some turbulence ahead, all of that should be recorded in the annual report and discussed at the annual general meeting, with which they normally say the AGM. And there's, there's a certain time frame that um, notice of the AGM should go out in advance of the AGM itself, okay? Um, and um, re relationships with any stakeholders, any new relationship, any change in stakeholders, um, um, all of that should be discussed. And good disclosure minimize any gaps between information available to directors and that are available to shareholders. So at this time, when you're reporting on the, on the, the, the when you're doing the annual report, all of the information that should be there for the different constituencies of the organization. So the shareholders should have enough information that makes them comfortable that they made a proper investment and they're gonna get a return on their investment. The board of directors should be able to see that all the things that they were planning to put in place and they've uh, uh, reached the milestones that they thought they should have at a certain time frame, that should be in place. And then um, the, the CEO and the CFO and the management team should also be seeing that this is the result of their hard work on a day-to-day -day basis, having gone through what it is that they need to go through. Um, so um, the other two points, the last two points that I want to go through is um, those disclosures. And, and the first one is the principle-based disclosure requires organizations to comply with the principle set down in the code or explain clearly to members in the annual board the reasons for not doing so. If for some reason they could not achieve X, Y, Z, that should be dealt with. Um, the following reporting requirements are generally accepted as best practices. Directors should explain their responsibility for preparing the financial accounts and reports that the business is a, is a growing concern. Information on the board should include its composition and changes, any changes um, um, in the independence of non-executive directors or, or any frequency and attendance at meeting responsibilities and performance. And the, the secretary should be keeping a record of who's attending these meetings. And so that if there is any disciplinary action that needs to be taken against a particular director, then the record would reflect that he only had attended five meetings out of 24 for the year or 12 as opposed to X, Y, Z. So that you keep a record for the term of the office that they're running. And um, any relationship with auditors, if there's been any change in any auditors, 
And sometimes too, what I understand companies discuss is that they should change auditors from time to time because if you get too relaxed with um, overseeing a company's books, you 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 get lax at your due diligence sometimes because because you did it last year on the year before the year before the year before it's more like a rubber stamp as opposed to really checking the balances in the accounts to check that the contracts are set up and the people are being paid according to the contracts that are placed to check to see if there's been any new vendors that have been added since the last time you know sometimes you don't take us uh, because of familiarity you do not take a, a strong approach to looking at and auditing um, the situation. And that's why some of the scandals that we've seen and, and heard about in the past was you notice that this has been the auditors for years and the auditors became friends with the CEO and the chairman and all this kind of thing. And so um, they just took for granted that the people were of high integrity and they did not do as, as, as deep a dive as they could have done if it was a new engagement. And so um, there's value sometimes in changing your auditors from time to time. And um, you would find that the big accounting firms usually follow the same principles. And um, one of the things that I've seen over the years is um, more accounting firms are getting involved with businesses from a training level, from a training perspective, from a, a, a management perspective, as opposed to just staying at the level of auditors and auditing their financial. And they are, I'm seeing a lot of people, a lot of times where persons who used to be auditors for an organization, they now end up being CEO for the organization or changing. So a lot of the managers and some of the banking houses and some of the um, um, businesses has come from your KPMG and your price water coupons and things like that, because they got to know a lot more about the organization, having audited their financials, and over a matter of time, they end up actually working in the organization and working for other organizations because of their experience and exposure. So all of that is taken into account in terms of the, 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 the principle base and the note that Anything that could even be considered a conflict of interest should be disclosed. Um, effectiveness of a, a internal control, statement of relations and dialogue with shareholders, um, any sustainability report, social transformation, any ethical safety, health, or environmental policy and practices, operating and financial review, all of that should be included in the disclosure um, on the annual report. and and. Um, they should be looking at um, the different approaches from a financial approach, from a customer service approach, from an internal business approach, and also from innovation and learning. Um, some companies are higher on research and development than others. And it depends a lot on if their products change or their products are such that you need individuals to continue. Like the pharmaceutical industry, for example, higher on research and development because new diseases are coming out, new um, um, prescriptions and new things to combat these diseases are coming out and those need to be in place. And lastly, um, from my perspective, um, disclosures on internal controls, uh, how important the internal controls in the public company and codified best practices in this respect. And the fact that um, all the regulations are complied with, with and all the reports are, are being sent to the government portals on a timely basis so that everybody knows what's happening with this organization. And everybody knows, everybody in the organization know the direction that the company is going. And so in this report, it states that there should be, the, that this should include the following changes that have occurred since the last risk assessment the scope of and quality of any monitoring of risk, who's in charge, who's reporting to whom, what, um, at what level is the CEO and C, the CFO and any CTO, which is the chief technical officer, because a lot of companies are moving towards digital. 
on how, where is that information being stored, that information, um, any of that changes are being sent to the board and the board is understanding what is being done and able to explain to the shareholders what's being done. Any scope and frequency of the of reports of the board to be expected as a board member should be giving written report or all reports that the secretary is keeping track of. Any significant controls, failings, and weaknesses relating to these should also be um, um, disclosed. Any external reporting processes and their effectiveness. Um, did we try a new um, situation? Did we open up a new division? How our division is doing? How it's impacting the organization? Those kinds of things must be must be um, included. And any acknowledgement of board responsibilities for the systems of internal controls and reviews of their effectiveness, again, included. Any explanation that a system of risk management is intended to manage risk rather than eliminate it entirely. And what risk, are, what risk can be eliminated, which the risk needs to be managed, which risk needs to be transferred, all of that should be documented so that you know that the company is going to be viable and being able to, to be ex, um, extended over a long period of time. And um, it also talks about a disclosure of board processes to deal with material internal controls, aspect of significant problems disclosed in the, pub in the published accounts, and specific information about weaknesses and in internal controls. Anything that could impact the organization in a, neg in a negative way should be dealt with. And actually, um, some, some arrangement where it, um, the effects of that deficiency should be dealt with uh, and reported to all members so that they understand what are the risks that are being run and what the organization is thinking about doing in order to mitigate those risks. And so that information should be readily available to your board, your management team, and your shareholders. So there's three different constituencies, other than employees, of course, and then the, the general public. Some of you actually answered a question related to stakeholders, as, in, as, as if the only stakeholders of an organization were the shareholders and the board of directors. When we talked about, when we talked about the stakeholders, we talk about anybody who could have influence or be impacted by this organization. And so that would include your employees, that would include the general public at large, that would include your customers. So when it comes to stakeholders, you're not only talking about the shareholders or the board of directors, you're talking about anybody who can be influenced by or influence the organization. So keep that in your mind when they talk about stakeholders. You're looking at a wider perspective as opposed to a very narrow perspective of shareholders. So from my perspective, we would have covered appropriately this chapter on corporate governance, putting corporate governance in, in practice. What it all boils down to is transparency. Transparency of transparency of reporting, clarity in terms of roles and responsibilities and um, information that should be disclosed at any given point. Those are the main areas that actually put this corporate governance in place. Because it do make sense having the rules there and Practically in the organization, you're doing something completely opposite to what the rules say. So, do we have any questions on anything that we discussed tonight? It's a lot to sink in. I know. Mm -hmm. But if you could just answer a question as we relate to those constituencies, you would, you, would be, you would be well on your way. And the rest of that stuff is fluff. Okay. 
None of the Greensbury, none of the, the Cadbury, none of the uh, Hades. No, 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 no. Because at the end of the day, the majority of what was said in any one of those reports ended up being a part of a combined code. And that combined code is, it covers all of that. Um, 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 I'm more concerned with that you are understanding the roles and responsibilities of those different people and who, how they report and what they report and to whom. Um, the specifics of Hague, Scansbury, Turnbull and all the rest of it is neither here nor there because they now have gotten to a combined code would include all of those reports right, in a one document, which they call a combined code. And it speaks to the same information in any event. So you would not have to distinguish between what came up out of which report. You're more concerned with what are the responsibilities and the roles of persons in those particular categories of individuals and what are some of the things that they must ensure is in place for the proper running of an organization. Because corporate governance is really the governing of the organization and governing in relationship to the legal, moral, and ethical way of doing business. Any other questions? No, I'm good. It's just gonna, I guess, gotta go back over all of these uh, different aspects and spend some time with them. Yeah. Uh, I think that's about it. Oh, I also, guys, uh, apparently that class effective presentation hasn't started. Is yet a check with Miguel? Uh, it hasn't started. So, I'll have okay. to not only to get my paper, but also to find out what's happening. Okay. Well, like I said, from my perspective, next week would be our last class um, in terms of formal class where we could get together as a review and if those of you want to, um, to review some of the things before the exam itself, which from the sounds of it, it sounds like um, you would prefer the Saturday morning as opposed to the Thursday evening from what I'm getting, but I'm gathering, which then ends up being... Yes, ma'am. Um, so, um, where am I, where am I, where am I? Next week is the seventh, we'll be completing chapter five, internal control. And then the following week, we'll do a review, which is the 14th. And you'll have all a good Friday and your Easter holiday and whatever else. And you'll have the entire week, beginning the week of the 17th or the 18th, sorry, which is a public holiday. And the exam would be on the 23rd. That's the time frame that I have, unless somebody else objects. I'm good with that. That's so, good you, so in essence, you have two weeks, two weeks for review. The week of the 14th and the week of the 21st. Just before the Good Friday holiday, which is the 14th, and just after that is, is another. Um, but I should say, you be, you'll be reviewing on the, week of the, on the week of the 14th. The week of the 11th is review, the week of the 18th is review, and you're actually taking an exam on the 23rd. That should be, if, if you, if you, Go through your notes and go to what you've highlighted and go to your past exam and see where you, where you fell down during the exam. The good thing is the midterm is only out of 20%. So the maximum you could have gotten, even if you scored 100% on the exam, it would come towards 20% of your final grade. But the, mid, the, the finals is going to come to as 50. So you want to get down path your methodology of answering the questions. You're going to get to know and understand the major definitions of the different style of ethics and some of the concepts that we, the major concepts 
that we discussed in the exam. Um, and then the methodology of, of approaching the case studies. I, and, and when I look at the composition of the paper, the case studies is 50% of the grade of the paper itself. So if you could get that down path, then you could kind of waffle through the other two sections. How many case studies I have to get down path? Five. <laughs> <laughs> I said five. Okay. That, sounds, that sounds like a good number to me. All right. I'm but, but, but I but I but I but I think I think if you some people might take the approach, let me answer them first and get them out of the way. Um I can't I can't say what your particular <clears throat> strategy is, but I am convinced that three hours is sufficient time to complete the paper. So we have in the same setup, 25, true, false, 25, short answer, and, and 50 is the case study. That's how it could be, same thing? I suspect so. I cannot, I cannot say, I, I'm going to have to look at the, um, speak with the examiner and see if that be, but um, what I've been, what I've been, Asked to say is that the format should be very similar. Okay, ma'am. But the exact composition, they might throw in. Can a, I have the same? Can, can I have you, the same multiple choice, please? Sorry. Can I have the same multiple choice for the midterm on the final? I can let one of your colleagues answer you. <laughs> It, it would be a, a, <laughs> a, a, you ain't gonna sue me and cause me and cause me to have to pay you. Um, I, I, you, 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 you trying to you trying to cause me to do to do a, a real smith. <laughs> or oh, either that, or you think I'm Chris Rock? I don't know. <laughs> it depends on your point of view. <laughs> I got to watch, I got to watch you up for trying to set me up. No child. No, you no, you no. won't be a will because he was like, um, uh, who was correct. Well, well, according to him, he already acted in the movie Bad Boys, so he just acted out with huh? he, Is it all kind of roles? Yeah, all them kind of roles where you do them kind of things, so that he was just acting it out. Bad Boys, bro. Fine. You do yeah. people will get money, you deal with them the white way. You get loyal. <laughs> you don't gotta do no talking. You sound like you sound like in the insurance industry. We used to uh let me turn this off. <laughs>